Okay, so don't count this as part of my time. But this is a slide, this is a picture I just got in WhatsApp showing a toddler watching uh, the YouTube channel with, uh, <laughs> with Orly's talk. Uh, um, yeah. It's one of our colleagues who couldn't come because her daughter is sick, so she was watching the. Okay, so anyhow. Okay, so this is not the way I s plan to start this, but ne nevertheless, what I'm going to try to tell you later is that these red dots is what we call consciousness. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so now, <laughs> now, <laughs> huh? You want to come? You want? Yeah. I thought you want to box me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, affordances, <laughs> right? Okay, so uh, we'll start with it with the beginning. Um, so. <coughs> Conscious experience is a remarkable phenomena for a lot of us. And as we all know, remarkable phenomena require remarkable explanations. Okay? And therefore, um, there has been a line of suggestions uh, that to have conscious experience, we need some kind of a magic or a secret ingredient. And I'm showing here a, a direct quote from uh, Victor, who is not here. I'm competing now with Yuri Buzaki on the other side of campus, which is not fair, <laughs> but it's... I, I guarantee you're hmm? Okay. <laughs> anyhow, so, anyhow, so, um, so people are looking for the missing ingredient that will make the difference between being consciously, ex con consciously uh, aware or to experience and not being, not experiencing. Or in the same pa pa paper, he actually asks specifically, where does the magic happen? So they're looking for some kind of a magic or a secret ingredient that will make the difference. And then there were a series of papers in the last uh, decade, which just ended, uh, urging us to look for what has been called in different um, papers, the true NCC or the NCC proper or the NCC substrate or constitutive N NCC or causal NCC all pointing to the idea that we should look for something very, very specific which constitutes consciousness. And specifically, Dominique has already shown this slide from a really beautiful uh, study uh, by uh, uh, Lucia and her colleagues, where they said that they argued that we should actually look, not look for a general NCC, but we should separate it into prerequisites for NCC, which, is, which are not the NCC itself, and consequences which come after once we are uh, aware but are not the NCC itself and we should concentrate rather on this NCC, they call it the NCC proper and another study in the same year um, called it the N What's NCC? Uh, Neural Correlate of Consciousness, sorry. Neural, Neural Correlates of Consciousness, of consciousness yes. Um, so that's another incarnation of the same, of the same argument uh, calling it uh, the neural substrates, and again, suggesting that we have the neural prerequisites, we have the neural consequences, but these are not the ones that we need to actually look into, but uh, rather we should try to distill uh, the neural, uh, the pro the neural coils of consciousness proper. Uh, this can also be uh, uh, represented in a, uh, on a timeline. So for instance, this is from uh, Claire Sargent and Lionel Nakash, uh, showing a timeline where we have upstream things that happen, and then we have downstream things that happen. So these happen before on the timeline, before we actually have conscious experience, and what happens after conscious experience it happens after, and then there is, there is this very special moment in between in which we have consciousness, but prerequisites are no longer, and consequences have hardly started, and we should point to try to figure out what is this uh, special uh, thing that happens in this moment, and this is another timeline showing exactly the same thing from Howie and Bain. So there's, it's kind of pervasive in, in the field to look for this very, very uh, specific uh, mechanism. In other words, what these um, uh, arguments try to say is that we have a lot of things that are prerequisites uh, for being aware, uh, conscious, there are consequences, and our aim should be to try to eliminate one by one uh, these prerequisites and then try to eliminate by experimentation the, what co should be called consequences, and eventually we are going to be left with the distilled or true NCC, okay, which is, will be the holy grail of what we're looking for. On the timeline, 
Uh, this actually says that we're going to try to take off the consequences and then try to eliminate the prerequisites. Oops, I thought maybe there should be something. Else. Okay, so. Uh, <laughs> hmm? It's the dot, right? Which is the <laughs> dot. The dot, right? <laughs> the, dot. the dot, exactly. Okay, so, so this is at least the picture that these, these papers have portrayed in, in the field. And they went uh, fur steps further to try to say, okay, what would be the sign, the signature of this true uh, NCC? What should, how would we know that we found a true NCC? So these, across these papers, these are the, the criteria. The first one is that this mechanism or process should invariably correlate with be having an experience, okay, being aware of something that happened. So whenever awareness change, this things should change as well, okay, invariably in all experiments. And uh, Aru et al., this is uh, Lucia's paper, say specifically that neuronal activity which does not meet that, which m changes in one experiment but does not correlate with awareness on another, should be delegated to the prerequisite stand. So that's one, that's one thing. Another one could be the tinkering with this putative mechanism, either shutting it down or stimulating it, should accordingly do the same thing to our conscious experience. It should be, if you think about the timeline, it should be not too late and it shouldn't be too early because too early is the prerequisite, too late is the consequences, so it would be somewhere in, somewhere in the middle. Um, it should, in, in the most extreme position, it should actually elicit or um, create conscious awareness even when it with in isolation without the prerequisites and without the, con the consequences and uh, another argument would be that it matches with, s with some sound uh, biological theoretical framework that will explain perhaps why this is what we call consciousness okay so there have been several several criteria and uh, using these uh, criteria or in general looking for the NCC uh, there's been many uh, suggestions or what could be the neural correlate of consciousness. This could be in space. So this is a list of uh, places in the brain which has been, have been associated with the NCC. Uh, it, it basically cover, covers a big part of the, of the brain. Uh, okay, so it basically covers a big part of the brain. If you look in, in time, using especially mainly uh, event-related potentials, then different electrophysiological phenomena have been associated using usually the contrastive paradigm, meaning contrasting situations in which we are aware and situations in which we are not, and then uh, put the, the emphasis on either pre-stimulus activity, which determines whether we will be or will not be uh, aware of what we are seeing, uh, and then the P1, the, the P2, the, the visual awareness negativity, which is elicited around here, and then a lot of, a lot of it is said about the P3. So all across um, that, that this uh, timeline, we have candidates for the NCC, and if we move from space and time to specific processes, we have a whole list of that as well, uh, starting a long time ago by the idea of integration by 40 hertz oscillations, and some about NMDA receptor mediated processes, uh, uh, the global neuronal workspace activation, recurrent activity by Victor, complexity for, from Tononi, and f information integration again from, from, from Tononi. So there's been a list of processes as well. The problem is that each one of these over, the over time has been refuted in, based on these criteria that I just showed, showed before. So there's always a counter argument for each one of these. And I want to just give two examples uh, to the first criterion of, having, of being invariably correlated with consciousness. So this is a paper by uh, Rafi Malach's, Malach's group from, from a few years ago uh, in which they showed um, object or faces masked with backward masking to, in a, to the degrees that about half of the pictures were seen and half of the pictures were not seen. So the very same stimulus a very important criterion in our field. We don't vary the stimulus, but the perceptual awareness varies from one trial to the other. And then when they sorted the trials to those in which the subject using ECOG with patients, uh, infracranial recordings, the subject sometimes sees and sometimes doesn't see the object. When the subject sees the object or the face, hear the faces, you have this big flurry or ignition of high frequency broadband 
activity, perhaps a correlate of uh, population firing, which Rafi called this a, a local ignition. And, the, and then if the, if the patient is not seeing in another trial the, the face, there's very little of this ignition. Okay, so the, igni the local ignition was suggested as the correlate of conscious awareness or even this sub to substantiate co co um, um, conscious awareness. And in good days, Rafi would even say that even if he puts it in the Petri dish, right, it would still be aware, right? Okay, so, so that's just to take, it, to take it to the extreme just for the case of, of the argument. And then, not, f not long time afterward, Lucia uh, tried another, another way to, to look at the neural correlative consciousness. And what, she, what they did is to present subjects with noisy images. Sometimes there were uh, figures embedded in these images, and sometimes not. And for some of these noisy images, the subject has before se seen before the clear image. So they have some prior knowledge of this picture before they see the noisy image. Okay? And then uh, it, it turns out that this uh, prior knowledge helps the subject. This is the difference between, um, between the blue and, and the red here. So if you have seen the picture before, you can see, you can detect the, the faint figure in the image better than if you haven't seen this figure before. So that's one thing. And another thing that they did was to manipulate the level of noise, how much noise was in the image. Okay, and you see that that too actually changes, your, of course, your ability to perceive the image uh, in this noisy, noisy thing. So that's, that is behaviorally. Now, again, with the same ECOG data in patients, okay, they look at the very kind of the same area that, that Rafi was looking at, the, uh, the face sensitive area in the fusiform gyrus, and they get this same um, ignis ignition. But now, if they compare the effect of noise in the image on this ignition, there is definitely an effect. So there's a bigger ignition when there is less noise, okay? But when they look at the effect of prior exposure, which affected behavior considerably, there is no effect on the, on the ignition. Okay? So now this kind of refutes this ignition as the proper NCC because it is, um, does not invariably change with awareness. And another problem with this, uh, with this idea comes from a study that we did, again, with patients with uh, intracranial electrodes. We presented uh, stimuli with uh, five different durations from 300 to, five to, one to 1,500 milliseconds. And in, if you look at an electrode in V1, uh, you see that the electrode actually responds for as long as the stimulus is on. So these are sorted trials, 300 millisecond stimuli, 600, and so on and so forth. You can see the trial by trial. Each line here is a trial. Trial by trial, there is an increase in this high frequency gamma activity. But if you go to an, to an electrode in the FFA, the same electrode where Rafi sees the ignition, there is a big flurry of activity at the onset of the stimulus. But then later on, even though this, imagine looking at the picture for a second and a half, you continue to see it throughout the second and a half. There is no difference. Okay, you still see it, but nevertheless, the high gamma activity dies out uh, to a very low level to the point that about a second into the stimulus, you can't tell whether the stimulus has already ended or not from looking at single trials in the data, okay? Um, so this also doesn't fit the, the idea of ignitions being the correlate of conscious perception, okay? Um, then there is the question of the global uh, neuronal network, the frontal parietal activity, and, um, and, the, and the P3, it's, it's, it's possible correlate, uh, which have been um, criticized or, or challenged by finding that the activity in front of parietal areas is diminished if you don't ask the subject to actually report whether they actually are seeing or not seeing. Uh, and the P3, again, shows this effect of a big uh, response when you detect the targets versus when you do not detect the target. But if the same stimulus, which is, visi which is visible or invisible but is not task-related, then, then there is no uh, P3 effect. Okay? And there's been a very new study just came out a few days ago uh, showing, replicating this uh, in a different way but from uh, Mike Pitt's uh, lab. So in different conditions, different NCCs um, come about. So, so the first problem with this idea of a pure, proper NCC is that practically there is not one candidate that has so to date met the criteria that, that were suggested. Okay? Um, it also gives a high uh, power to uh, null results because every null result actually refutes 
uh, a po refutes a possible can candidate. Uh, and it also smacks a little bit of Cartesianism, right? So it's like everything has to come in to come into some center where I if it changes, uh, consciousness changes or not. But that doesn't have to be uh, a, p a part of this. But it, it might um, hint to this kind of a, of a Cartesian view. More than that, uh, I, I argued before, and I don't, I don't have time to go into the details, details now, but in fact, there is no a priori consideration that would tell us whether, uh, whether a candidate NCC, NCC uh, is really the proper NCC or whether it is a prerequisite or, um, or, a, or a consequence. So consider, for instance, I did have um, an optogenetic mechanism that I could use safely in humans, and I could turn on and off a specific candidate uh, to being the, the proper NCC. And I was lucky, and I actually am able to shut down consciousness and turn it on again. Somebody would come and say, you just turned on and off a necessary prerequisite, which, which is not sufficient to actually create uh, the, the, the conscious awareness. And same thing for the consequence, if it's an automatic, obligatory consequence. Okay? Um, so I was just saying that to recognize it pure NCC, you actually have to know in advance what is the signature of a pure NCC, and that is a, bit, a little bit circular. Okay? Um, so what, I'm, what I actually want to say from, from now on is to try to argue that what we actually sh may need to do is not to get rid of the prerequisites and, con and, con and, the, pure con and the consequences, but actually to get rid of the center part of the pure NCC and think about the whole gamut of different, um, of different parameters as what actually constitutes consciousness. And so this go it goes this way. I'll start with some, um, some I think, non-controversial non premises about what we are doing. So the first is that what we're trying to actually explain is subjective experience, the fact that we have a subjective experience. The other premise is that a lot of what happens in our brain, in our cognitive system, in our mental system, goes on without conscious experience, okay? And that we are able usually to tell the difference between being consciously aware, having an experience, and not having an experience, although I'm not arguing that this is infallible. You know, I'm not arguing that whatever I say about my experience is my experience, but we usually are able to tell the difference, otherwise we wouldn't be able to do the research that we are doing, okay? And the last one is that the only direct access to my experience is mine. Okay? So I only have direct access to my conscious experience. Otherwise, it's always mediated by asking the question. And in fact, even in myself, it is mediated by asking the question. So the point is that there is the question. Okay? So I ask, did I see the gorilla or did you see the gorilla? Okay? Did you just uh, see a word flash on the screen? When I switched the slide, did you see a, wor a word flash? There was no word flashing, okay? Um, did, uh, just before, we were pl you were playing with the sounds, and, and, I, and you, you asked, did you hear, did you hear the, the neurons uh, ticking? And, and I had to ask, did I, did I hear the neurons ticking, or didn't I hear the neurons ticking? So, so I asked myself the question, okay? Did you, did you see it? Did you experience In other words, did you have an experience, okay? And how would I know? How do I know uh, how to answer the question? Like everything, I have to make a decision, and I have to make a decision means that I have to look for, I'm looking for evidence, okay? I'm looking for evidence that I actually had an experience. Now, the question is, what would be the evidence? And in my, in my view, understanding what would be the evidence is critical for understanding how conscious experience uh, uh, unfolds in our, in, our, in our mind or brain. And I'm suggesting that these, uh, this evidence is nothing supranormal, not quantum physics or, or something that pervades the universe, but probably, although this is open, uh, probably the, the same kind of, of mechanisms that we were thinking before uh, as prerequisites and consequences of, of conscious experience. So I listed just a random, random list of uh, the arousal level, uh, the level of activity in early sensory cortices, uh, whether there is persistence of, of activity, uh, whether some verbal material popped out because of the, what, I, what I saw, whether, whether I have the emotional re response that I would expect when I see something or when I hear something, um, whether there's a spatial tag, whether there's a temporal context, whether there's a memory trace that was suddenly activated for some reason, uh, which is related to what I was supposed to be seeing or not seeing. So all these are 
pieces of evidence that I could collect in order to figure out whether I'm conscious or not. So this is where it comes to these, these red dots. Okay? So you can think of all these parameters as a multi-dimensional multi space. Okay, which, where each of these axes is one, one of these parameters. Of course, I can't, uh, I can't draw anything more than 3D, so we'll resort to 2D. Okay, so if I take any two of these parameters, I can draw the state of my system. So my system goes and figures out, what is, am I experiencing? Am I not experiencing? Have I experienced the gorilla just a second ago? <laughs> so it, it finds, when the, when the question is asked, the system finds itself in one of these positions in, uh, in this two-dimensional graph, but in fact in a multi-dimensional graph, okay? Um, and these are some, just some, some of the possible parameters. And now what needs to be done is to put some, some difference, some, some threshold between, uh, between what, what I would eventually call being experiencing and, and, not, and not experiencing, okay? And so I put this arbitrary uh, threshold between the blue dots and the, and the yellow and the yellow orange dots and now I can be in some situation uh, in, the, in this position where I have a lot of sensory activation a lot of ignition uh, in high order visual cortex and I don't really have so much activation of a memory trace of this particular stimulus okay but in another point in time I might be in this position where I have a memory trace activated so with much less of, of activity in uh, uh, sensory cortex, I would still say I am conscious because these dots is what I call consciousness. Okay? These dots I call unconscious. Um, now, you, you, you notice here that I put the, the threshold here so that there will be some places where even if I have a very, very strong memory trace and there is nothing in sensory cortex, completely zero, then I would still say I didn't see anything. Okay? So the, what exactly is the shape of this border? I have no idea, but uh, this is what, what it would be. Now, if you think of, um, of my examples uh, of, of Rafi's and Lucia's paper be before, this would explain what is actually going on. So in Rafi's experiment, they were ma manipulating the, uh, the, the, um, the sensory evidence okay, by, by this masking, or actually by the fluctuation of sensory evidence by, by, by this masking. And so um, they, were, they were moving the, um, the, from this point to that point. Okay? On the other hand, in Lucia's, in Lucia's study, they were actually moving the system from this point to this point without changing anything in the, in the sensory evidence, okay? It's just that here we don't have a, a memory trace to activate, and here we have a memory trace to activate. So it brings us from this, to this um, region to that region. Um, just to, to, make, to make the point that there is something interesting about understanding these parameters, I drew here the para this parameter of ignition as if it's gradual and continuous, but an ignition is something which is kind of a, a bursting or exploding, right? So that's not a problem. We can just say, okay, this is the way it actually is, right? So we can either be in this place or in this place, and this part of space is empty uh, because it never happens that you, you are in this space. But the, the, the explanation would be the same explanation. Now, in fact, uh, thinking about that, I, I realized that this can also explain the issue of adaptation in, in, <coughs> our, in our study. Because what if, what if once, once the subject has seen the, the, the picture of a face or an object for 300 milliseconds, uh, it's enough to create a, a memory trace of some sort of this image. So f from now on, for the rest of the time the stimulus is presented, I don't need to be uh, in this high state of ignition to still say I'm seeing it. I can be in this position point. So we might actually be moving in time from this point to that point along the one and a half second of viewing the image, which will explain why I still call this an experience. Okay? It's enough to be an experience. Now, an important point uh, that I want to make, which I think will be resonate with Mike's talk uh, la later on, and I think it's a difference, I think, from, from Mike's position, is that although I talked a lot about this decision about whether I'm I'm, I was conscious or not conscious. I'm not arguing that this, the decision is being conscious. So there are two things. There is the being conscious or not conscious, or being not conscious, <coughs> having an experience or not having an experience. And then a decision about that experience. Okay? The decision about that experience is important in understanding the experience, but it's not the experience itself. And I'm saying this because it, it's important for me uh, to point out that that 
we don't need to report, even to ourselves, we don't need to answer the question to ourselves of whether I'm seeing something or not seeing it, because as long as I am in this part of space which is red here, even if I'm not at the moment, uh, even if I'm not at the moment asking myself, I am in this point of space, in the parameter space, and so this is what we call being conscious, okay? So that's actually a nice, I think, benefit of, uh, of this position, that it allows us to have ongoing, continuous uh, experience, even in, in times of no big change, when nobody, nobody probes us, we don't probe ourselves, we are immersed in this very beautiful movie or a natural scene or reading a book and so on. But if somebody asked us, we would say, yes, we were conscious, right? Although nobody, and no, not, not even ourselves, stopped us to ask the question, okay? But it's not surprising. We simply were in the right, right position in, in space, okay? So, so these are the, the benefits for me for, from thinking about the problem in this way. So um, um, the, the po the, from looking at it from a cognitive neuroscience perspective, I think of other uh, functions that we are trying to explain. They are always multi-componential and multi-dimensional. And it, it's, easier for, it's easier, I think, to, or it's, it makes sense to think of this very, very complex high order function that we call experiencing in the same kind of, of framework and not try to say that this particular function has one beautiful, elegant mechanism that will explain it, whereas other functions we can do with a lot of patchwork of different uh, mo modules and functions and so on. Um, I already said it, it separates the introspection or decision from the state of having uh, experience. Um, it allows, if you, if you will, to have experiences which are different in their flavor, but yet is experienced as an experience. Because if you are in different points of space within this red region of my graph, you, are, you have different conscious experiences, but all of them have this kind of a prototype, thanks Ron for giving me this terminology, is this prototype similarity of conscious, conscious experiences. Um, something that Orly uh, said a couple of years ago to me made me think that uh, perhaps it's also a spell against zombies. Uh, because if you think of, being, of having a, a subjective experience as nothing but being in this state of regular mental, cognitive, emotional functions, then you must have, once you have all these regular mental functions, you will be conscious. So you cannot have one without, without the other. It's just that's what, that's what, it, is, what it is. And I want to finish with saying that I don't think this is in any way a pessimistic view of the field. I know I was not trying to say that we <coughs> everything is refuted so we can't find anything. Rather, this is, an, I think, a nice way of trying to explore the field because it opens up an, an interesting questions about this parameter field. So, First, which factors actually count in this? Not every parameter in the brain or in, cognitive, in the cognitive system or emotional system should count for experiencing. There should be some that do and some that don't. And may, maybe some are weighted higher and some are weighted less. And this is something that we can explore. Importantly, it's not in, by introspection. It's not that I'm suggesting that I'm asking myself whether I'm experiencing and by introspection I will figure out all these parameters. This will be open for manipulations just as we usually do. We manipulate these parameters and we'll see whether they affect my eventual judgment of whether I experience or not. Um, we can ask whether dif different which of the different parameters actually affect the conscious experience of neuropsychological patients, like agnostic patients or like neglect patients. And then something that I, for instance, suggested in my PhD that negle in neglect is particularly missing the, the spatial tag from these dimensions or putting you in some place on the spatial, spatialness uh, uh, axis, which renders you unconscious, just pushes you to this point, point, by part of space where you're unconscious. Um, I already talked about the distribution of parameters being like linear or not linear. And we also can ask how um, does the actual question affect what we think about our experience? So we usually think, for instance, about experiences of have as all or none. We either experience or we don't experience. And, and for instance, I, I remember from Stan's papers from the early 2000s, very nice results with distributions where patients either say this or say that. They rather almost never say something in the, in the middle, right? So the question is whether this is a factor, uh, an, an, an outcome of the point where I'm 
need to make a decision, right? So then I have to make, to make the, the decision when it's black or white. But in fact, perhaps before I ask, I ask the question, it's more graded in, in this way or maybe in that way. Okay? I'm not sure exactly how you would go about figuring out whether the experience is really gradual or all or none. But I'm just saying that it's very possible that it's actually the question, the retrospective question, which makes it look like it's all or none. OK, I think in that I laid the, my, my argument. Um, I really love this um, cartoon. And I want to finish by thanking uh, especially the members of the Deconstructing and Reconstructing um, Consciousness, which have, has been tremendously effective for me for clarifying uh, s some of the points of this thing that I spoke about before, but not in, the, in this detail. And um, I want to, if not sure who, I think Liad, Liad said there was nothing, nothing was written about, use, nothing useful was written, nothing worth reading. Uh, but so for me, if there's something worth reading, it's, it's, the, it's this book, okay? Which I think is, um, is important and inspiring, and I urge everybody uh, to read this. It's a book from the 50s. Okay, thank you. Yeah, not Rafi. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you speak. <laughs> Leon, thank, thanks for the great talk. So as the example of, the, of multidimensionality that you're suggesting, you talked about um, perceptual excitation and memory. But aren't those really the same thing? Because you're talking about either activation as a result of incoming physical stimuli, or sustained activation from a slightly previous stimulant. What else could there be? Oh, there could be a lot of things. I mean, you, could have a, you can have activation without having a memory trace, right? And you can have a memory trace without having an, an activation. So these, these are two different, um, different um, entities that could be interactive, and they might, they might be interactive, but they're two different things. You can have activation of the FFA without ever seeing that face, okay? But if you actually know that face because you have a memory trace of it in your hippocampus, for example, that would be activated as well, right? It might then boost the activation in the, in the sensory areas, but it's two different things. It's not necessarily the same thing. But, but isn't there a uh, final common pathway of? Uh, that I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that we should look for a final common pathway because that's what I call Cartesian. We don't want to think we, you, it might be the fact that eventually Descartes was right. I mean, but uh, it, I prefer not to think this way. <coughs> yeah. um, OK, very interesting. Um, what I'm not, uh, maybe that's a follow up on the zombie issue you mentioned. <laughs> so you put a, it seems like you put a lot of weight on the subjective experience. So how would you? All of the weight. OK. So uh, let's say you build a very sophisticated robot. How would you know? How would you test uh, whether, it is, whether it is conscious or not? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question, and it definitely related to, to this, uh, to this um, framework. So I would say if I, if I knew, if, I, if we were like at the end of the road, and I knew what the parameter space is that I called um, I call conscious experience, then if I could measure this, the same, the same parameters in my robot or, or program it to have these, uh, uh, this place in the parameter space, I would be obliged to say that this robot has an experience. I would have no reason at least to think that it's not because this is what I call having an experience, okay? Now, see, if we're not at the end of the road, then I have a different, different answer for how would, how would I know. I think most of it is based on superficial resemblance bet between behaviors. But maybe this is not related to that talk. So, so, so uh, this might be um, a not the right question given your title, but I, I find it very hard to not ask what's different between one side of the line and another. Why this side of the parameter space, this area of the parameter space, leads to <coughs> experience and the other one doesn't? Perfect. You had, somebody had to ask this question, right? And I tried not to let Rafi ask, and now you. <laughs> so 
there's always the question of why, okay? Why having 40 hertz oscillation would make you conscious? Why having global neural work workspace working ha give you oscillation? Why a high uh, integration information would give you, give you conscious awareness? And, and that's always the, qu the question that is kind of people hand wave in trying to explain because they, it has the problem of having in like you a priori decide what it should look like and then look for something like that in the brain. And so within your, your uh, conceptualization of what it should look like, you find something which matches, which is fine, but it's very close within your hypothesis. So it's, it's a hard question uh, to, to answer, but I, if, I, if you push me, I would say that the question is, how do we learn that this is what we should call conscious experience? Okay, so I would, uh, this is just hardly bo uh, cooked uh, thoughts, okay? But I started thinking about it, and I, my only uh, hypothesis is that while we grow up, while we develop, right, we learn from experience, from our parents and from, this, from the social network around us, what it is that we, that we call conscious experience, okay? Because think about it, think about the question, some, uh, about the question of have you seen something? And I ask you the question and you say yes, okay? Without, and then I say, ah, so what was it like, okay? And so you realize that it has to be some, something which it is like when you say, yes, I've seen something. And so like, what did it do to you? Did it elicit some experience, some emotion in you? Or, ah, so this, when, when you say experience, you mean that it, has some con some emotional valence to it, okay? So tell me where it was then. Ah, it has to have a spatial uh, a spatial tag to it, right? And so on and so forth. I mean, I'm hand waving because I don't know exactly what the real parameter space is, but this is the way in which we would learn uh, what part of the space is what we call conscious experience. One of the factors that you put into your kind of uh, list of parameters was ver uh, verbal report. Mm -hmm. Now, verbal report is something that we have. It's very important for our consciousness. It's not very important for the consciousness of a dog. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but nevertheless, we sort of have, uh, there is fairly wide consensus that there is something like a subjective experiencing of a dog that it mm -hmm. actually feels pain mm -hmm. and pleasure. So. The question is not whether or not a verbal report is important for our consciousness, because obviously it is. Mm -hmm. But what happens, uh, but do you really need it as part of your, par in, uh, in your parameter space? And what happens during evolution? So it could be the case, for example, that when we develop uh, language and verbal report, the uh, relative importance of other parameters in your list is, is smaller, gets smaller, because this already does some of the, this, this is sort of changing the, the landscape of, of consciousness and things like that. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what actually do you think are the minimal kind of parameters that you would put into your space? Those parameters that would allow us also to follow the, the evolution of consciousness, because I think that there is a general consensus in this room that uh, it has probably evolved. Yeah. So th that's, that's the question for research. I think the research should actually uh, ask what are the parameters, but always realizing that it's a, it would be a set of a set of a complex set of parameters uh, some with a higher weight and some with lesser weight I take your point which is I think really interesting is that if along evolution some parameters are introduced which were not there before for instance language then they might actually demote some other parameters to have lesser weight in the space so the shape of the space actually changes over time that's an interesting uh, an interesting thought I don't know exactly how to th think about other creatures other than humans uh, to say uh, whether it's a different type of experience or not the same type of experience. I simply have no tools to, to say that, but I think the point is really interesting about the reshaping of the, of the space. Think about neglect patients, for example, who have a lesion uh, in their parietal cortex. I mean, it's a common saying among neurologists that, uh, that the shape of their, of their experience actually sh changes. So, so the, so it's a kind of a way of, say, way of saying it, but maybe there is some truth to it, that you actually change the parameter space rather than the space itself outside. Rup yeah, we have time for Rafi? <laughs> I'm just saying that because we have been arguing for five months. <laughs> You're into your call. You tell me. No, no, please, please. No, 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 no Rafi, Rafi, it's you. You have the final. The great talk, first of all. Uh, one question is related to this line that 
that you said. And I, I didn't see in any claim that you made in this talk an argument against the possibility that the line is defined by some common principle, some dynamic or something that we simply did not discover yet. I completely agree that the activity, the adaptation is very interesting, powerful argument against just activity, just, you know, high level. But maybe synaptic effect or something will explain the line. You, right now you're giving it to us as a list and we should sort of buy it because, you know, all this, but, but, but the beauty of science is to try to find a common principle that will explain the line. That's yeah. The question is whether you okay, have an so argument against that. So I don't, ha I don't have a... I don't need that. I don't need. I don't. I don't have a, s a strong argument against the possibility that eventually there will be some um, Darwinian principle, okay, natural selection, that will explain why the line, the, the sh this uh, plane actually, this multidimensional plane, has the shape it has. For the reasons that I explained, it seems to me that if I have to put my bets on whether we will find such a principled principle uh, that will explain exactly the shape of, of this or if we will have to, uh, fi to, re to settle for the fact that this is the, the, shape of the shape of the plane and it's learned by society and maybe it's e somebody will find that it's different in different societies uh, and so on. I would bet on the, on the second. I don't have a principle. I, I have uh, some arguments that I didn't have time to go into suggesting that I don't think we will have the tools to tell that this is the mechanism, even if there is one. Uh, but, you know, how do I know? You know? Many people have said that things will not happen, and they happen. So, um, yeah, Thank you. thanks.